Hello, everyone. Welcome, you brave souls who came here on a Saturday to continue your education and learning. My name is Bradley Ball. We're here about uh, migration to Azure, customer experiences, and best practices. Um, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to try and go a little fast through a couple things because I've got only one demo, but I want to make sure that we get through it. Now, what, there's a lot to hit. Um, I'll be uploading this, and, uh, and there's a lot of links in here. If you want to take a picture, I specifically didn't do the link the way, you know, it paste it and it gives you the name of the thing, but not the actual link. So if you want to take a picture, you can get to it. Um, this is me. This will be my briefest slide. Uh, I work for Microsoft, Azure Fast Track, do cool stuff. Uh, been a lot of places. Um, we're going to have a couple terms that we're going to cover. Best practice, what is best practice? Azure CX, Fast Track CXP, because that's my group that I work with, um, the PG there. What is a CXP and what is an Azure Fast Track, right? Those are all confusing terms. So the one thing I want to make sure and clarify right off the bat for you is a best practice is the best practice for you and your company. Everybody likes to think that there is a road that is always set that you must go down when we're looking at migrating and all these other things. And I even often get the question, um, how do you do this internally at Microsoft? The answer to that is poorly. Oh yeah, I, I can't tell you how many internal groups I've consulted with to go, we need business intelligence, we make these products. You know, the people who build it are in a couple buildings just right across the street. We should, we should meet with them if you need to. Um, so there is no magic bullet. Even at uh, Microsoft projects in IT, I have seen traditional failings that people would think, oh, my company is so out of whack because we can't do the following things. That's not the case at all. Um, so a best practice, when I think about that, a customer, I'll give you an example. We're going to do an analytics platform. They come to me, they go, should we use Spark? Should we use Snap's dedicated pools? Should we use serverless? And my answer to them is going to be, what is it that you'd like to achieve? What is the skill set you currently have on hand? What are people's comfort with this technology? Are you planning on introducing training? Are you going in a new direction? When you hire, what skill sets will you be looking at in the future? I have met data scientists that are much more comfortable with T-SQL than they are with Python, Scala, and R. That's perfectly fine. But for those people, I would not recommend using a notebook with Python, Scala, and R. I would say, let's use a dedicated SQL pool. Let's use a serverless SQL pool. Let's use traditional T-SQL. If your data isn't large enough, if you don't have the volume, velocity, or variety to require an MPP system, I met with a customer recently just this week where my guidance to them was, don't use Synapse. Let's look at hyperscale because a traditional SQL Server relational database would be much better for them. Um, so the key thing to keep in mind is when you look at what is a best practice, how are we going to architect this, how are we going to build it, how do you maintain it, what is the skill set you have on hand, what are you going to hire for in the future, and how does that best work within your organization to be able to keep those standards up and running. So a best practice is often guidance. If I don't have anything and I'm starting from scratch, it's guidance. That's it. That's really what a best practice is. But if you have something that works cohesively for you, your industry, your company, stick with it. It's always good to say, hey, could we be doing something better? Um, but I often have to have that conversation with folks when we look at what a best practice is. So this is a little bit about my org. I just want to give us a quick plug because we're in over 24 countries and not everybody knows who we are. We specifically work with customers on all those different scenarios that are listed right there. Um, you can get to your country's page on us on aka.msfta, uh, Fast Track for Azure. So a CXP is a customer experience group. What we do is we sit within engineering. We work directly with customers to onboard you to Azure, new projects, migrations, things of that nature. We work directly with the product group to be able to give feedback from experiences with CSS, um, to be able to get you through trouble tickets, uh, to be able to make it to where you do things easier with less risk, or if there is trouble that you have a partner there to be able to help you. Um, the barrier for, barrier for entry, super low. Um, you need to be nominated by one of your technical account managers, an SSP, a CSA in Microsoft, or from a gold partner that you're working with that is a partner with Microsoft. Both of them can do that through that portal right there. Um, and then you have to, after your product is in uh, whatever your environment is, is in Azure, within 12 months of production, you need to make, uh, be spending $5,000 a month. That's not really a difficult thing to do for Azure, right? Ex especially for, uh, for companies. So, um, 
we're with you by project. Once the project is over, we leave, we go work with other customers, um, but we're there from the beginning to the end. And we cover apps, data, networking, that whole list. So um, if you're looking at doing something in Azure, I would say, please look at engaging with us because that's what we're there for. So our agenda. It's a video game conference, right? That's our theme. We're not doing an agenda, we're doing levels. We're gonna be covering migrations, some things you need to know from on-premise up to, up to the cloud. Uh, level two is going to be CI CD. Level three is gonna be security. And level four is HADR. We'll try and get through these rather quickly. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna introduce a typical diagram that a customer will come to me and say, hey Brad, we've got this project in Fast Track, come work with us, here's our diagram and this is what we wanna do. In this particular case, I had a customer and they have a bunch of databases on elastic pools. They want to consume this data uh, and have it there for their OTP customers, utilize Azure Data Factory to be able to push this into Data Lake Gen 2. They want to do some fancy data science-y type things uh, using Databricks. Um, they would like to then land that data in Azure Synapse, and then they're going to put it in Azure Analysis Services for scale, um, and they're going to have some A-series Power BI that allow their customers to be able to do self-service reports. And that's a wonderful thing to come in with. That's a good outline for a project. That's a good outline for us to start with. But when you actually do your migration, there's some additional things that we need to think of. Again, if you're looking for a framework to be able to help you go, hey, we're looking at a cloud migration, we don't have any steps, this is a good outline. But if you've already gone, we've got a business case, or we've got a direction from a CFO, you can sip, skip some of these steps. Um, but the cloud adoption framework is specifically something where it lays out these 10 different steps and then goes into massive amounts of detail with them. One of the key things that we're going to end up talking about is specifically a landing zone. Looking at a landing zone to be able to make sure that we actually have the environment we need to land in Azure. So what is a landing zone? If you've never had one, let's say you're new to Azure, you have a subscription, but you haven't provisioned anything, and you say, I want to move data up there. It could be we're going to take and build an analytical platform up there, and we're going to start shipping data up. It could be we want to do a massive migration, and we're going to move VMs, apps, data, the whole kit and caboodle. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at your subscriptions. We're going to say, do you need dev test subscriptions that go under your main root subscription? We're going to look at potentially, do you want to divide things up by a QA subscription and a prod subscription and then a dev? Do you have a POC subscription? Some companies I know have literally hundreds of subscriptions where uh, they have an org within a company that's going to use uh, Azure and they get a sub subscription that all of their resources go into for all of the things that they're going to be doing. A lot of this, again, gets back to that best practice. How do you want to manage that? How do we want this set up? Once we determine what we want out of the subscriptions, we will provision those subscriptions, and then we'll determine how are we tracking that data in those subscriptions via resource groups. I have some customers that go, I'm going to put an entire project, everything I'm going to use, the app, uh, the network, the data, in a resource group. I have other customers that go, I'm only going to put networks in a resource group. I'm going to only put Azure SQL databases in a resource group. I'm only going to put Synapse analytic workspaces in a resource group. And so that way I can grant permissions on those individual resource groups to the teams that actually manage those individual things in silos. And so that's something to consider as well. Okay, so we've got that organized. We really haven't deployed anything yet. The next thing that we're going to look at deploying is the connection of our network. Now, we can go over the public internet, but we all know that's not very secure. Typically, what we'd like is a data gateway, a site-to-site -site VPN, where we're able to connect a virtual network in Azure to your work back virtual network. And then we're gonna have some IPs that we're gonna whitelist. Maybe you have developers that already connect via VPN into your network, so they're all automatically going to be using uh, those IPs to be able to connect into Azure. And that's gonna be your base network. We're also gonna go through things called policies, where we can say, anytime a resource is provisioned, here's specific tags that go in it. We could also say, anytime something is provisioned, they need to, people need to have these following roles. We can also make Azure Active Directory groups with roles associated with them and policies associated with them to say, people in this group can do the following things and they cannot do the following things. We can really lock this down. It gets very granular. 
The other thing that we're going to look at is once we've got that network access is where are we going to land the data. That's probably where we start to go back to that project architecture and we'll go, well, we're going to provision Synapse, we're going to provision a data lake, and what we're going to do is we're going to begin working to get that data into, um, into Azure. But there's these few things that we've got to clean up first. One of the things we want to think about is monitoring. Are we going to use log analytics? Are we going to use Azure monitoring? What services do we need to monitor? Do we want custom monitoring on things? You can build custom monitoring. You can also use KQL. But if you're not familiar with KQL, you're going to learn how to do KQL queries because you can service those up in Power BI. They're a little bit different. If you're used to T-SQL, you're going to be able to find them. We have great modules on Microsoft Learn to be able to go through to teach you how to do KQL queries. But part of it is going to be, what do you want to use? We also have wonderful partners, SolarWinds, Redgate. They're in our marketplace. You could deploy them directly into your environment. We've already got a contract with them. Maybe you've got licenses, and you're just converting from on-prem into the cloud. Again, when we look at this environment, there's a lot of stuff for us to be able to sit down and talk about. And what we want to do is make sure that we get the right people in the room, have the right conversations, and then we start to proceed. Once we start provisioning resources, typically we've got all this thought about, but these are the pre-setup things that we really need to do when we start with the migration. And there's additional things on there. Again, I'm going to try and keep going so we can get through some of this pretty fast. Uh, but the cloud adoption framework, they have those diagrams online as well. So if you uh, <clears throat> Google or Bing, Bing is fine-ish. If you Google Cloud Adoption Framework, Azure, it will take you directly to those resources. And in some cases, um, we have BICEP or ARM templates that you can deploy if there is an architecture that particularly fits the needs you have. In some cases, we're, de we're developing those so that way we can deploy those resources. Because the big thing to think about in Azure is there's no physical hardware that you're actually provisioning. Un underneath the covers, we have physical hardware, but everything is code as hardware. So very, very important to keep in mind. So that was level one, migration to the cloud. Level two, CI, CD. I'm going to give a little plug here. Um, here's a whole series I've got for CI, CD and Azure Synapse. CI, CD is something that is, we're hearing more and more the term, um, the amalgamation of DevOps and data to data DevOps. Has anybody heard data DevOps before? Okay, a couple hands. All right. So this is essentially the CI CD process for data. But it's not something we typically do if we're DBAs. I didn't do that. Let me take a quick poll. How many people would identify as developers? Anybody? Okay, we got two. This is a safe space. You're all right. <laughs> um, how many people would say they're DBAs? Business analyst or, or BI type folk? Okay. Um, network admins? Storage, well, the people who aren't raise your hand. Management? A little, little bit? Data engineer? Data scientist? Yeah, okay. Data wrangler, I love that. Data wrangler, yeah. That's a fun one. I feel like we should have a cowboy hat on for that. We're, let's go wrangle some data. I, I do hear some ridiculous stuff sometimes. Once I got on a call with a customer and they said, yeah, we want you to come over and science our data. Well, that's not how that works. That's, that's not it at all. So one of the key things to keep in mind is um, these blogs are over at the uh, tech community. Buck Woody runs this blog. A whole host of us go over there and participate in it. Step one is how I link it up. But when we start to get to step three, step four, step five, these are things that are ubiquitous for other technologies. Step th part three, what I'm really doing is we're d making a build pipeline in Azure DevOps. Uh, four is a release pipeline. And then five is we're actually taking an ARM template for our Snaps Analytics workspace and we're deploying a QA environment via a build and a release pipeline. And so everything that we do, we really want to think about the DevOps portion. Because when we start to deploy that, that's going to be one of the first things I ask. Hey, how do you want to manage this environment? If we're putting together ARM templates, where are we storing it? Are we putting it in a GitOps repo? Are we putting it um, over in Azure DevOps? Are you using a deployment mechanism on-prem? A um, lot of things for us to consider there. Uh, so the steps are easy, though. We set up a code repository, create a build package, create a release pipeline. This is going to be the demo. So up in Azure, I've got a resource group. 
and I've got an AKS cluster sitting up there, um, and I've got a SQL managed instance on Azure Arc. By the way, now is a wonderful time to, if you know Book Woody on Twitter, say Brad is typing in a demo. He absolutely loves that. He thinks that everyone should type in demos. Big, big fan of that. Just let him know. He'll be very proud of me. Right here, you'll see, so I have this instance called uh, B-Ball SQL, uh, but I actually have three nodes. They're up and running. You can see I've had them up here for quite a long time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take and I'm going to update a table and I'm going to use some DevOps to be able to do that. So I've got this running. We're going to connect to it via um, Azure Data Studio. It's picked up my Arc Data Controller. It's found my instance right here. If I double click on this, it should connect. Oh, there we go, manage. And this will pull up some information. You can see I've got a database here. I've got some uh, Grafana and Kibana dashboards that I could take a look at. Um, I've got the traditional stuff. Uh, that I could come and take a look at, uh, all, all the typical stuff for Azure Data Studio. I've got this table I've created. You can see SQL Bits 2022. And I, I'm, I'm storing uh, just a primary key ID, uh, session title, speaker ID, but you know what? I, I forgot we probably want to track our ratings. So I'm going to go into my Visual Studio project, um, and I'm just going to add that real quick. We'll say rating. I'm going to make it an integer value because we're going to give it a numeric value. I'm going to save this real quick, and I'm going to say, let's, uh, let's go ahead and build my solution. All right. It has run. I'm going to come over to Git, and I'm going to say uh, added rating column. I'm going to commit this, and then I'm going to push this up to my repository. You can see I get this little thing right down here saying that the push has occurred as a background process. Uh, looks like we were also successful. So let's come over here to my repository. I'm just going to go down to my repo, take a look at my files. And you can see that uh, my last change was just now. And the way that this works, if I want to be able to use a Visual Studio data project to be able to manage my schema on this, um, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to upload that project, connect it to a GitHub repo. I know I've skipped through a lot of those steps. Um, trust me, we have that all documented. Um, then I, I push that. And every time I do a commit and then I push it up, it's going to write that directly. As a matter of fact, if I open this up, um, I should be able to find exactly the file that was updated. So see, it, it was under DBO, no, not stored prox, under tables, oh wait, DBO, tables, and then SQL bits 2022. And, and we know it was the column I added. So here's the thing, right? Because this is where it gets a little abstract and esoteric for a DBA. Theoretically, we have files that now live in this repository. But what we've got to do is we've got to compile the Visual Studio code to get a DAC pack. Um, and so the way I'll do that is I'm going to come over here to a pipeline. This is called a build pipeline. I'm just going to edit it so we can take a look at it real quick. And I've got a couple tasks. What happens is this is an agent job that works with Azure DevOps. And so you automatically get this machine. And what I want to do is find the tasks that are going to help me do what I want to do. And there's a whole marketplace for tasks. And the first task I want is actually going to be to build a Visual Studio solution, because that's what I need to do. When I build that solution, the output is a DAC pack file in the bin folder. I'm going to copy these to a staging directory. Now, there are variable names that we will use within Visual Studio. This is a temporary staging um, on that VM that is that agent. It's a reserved word. Again, we don't typically use DevOps. Most of us don't if we're not a developer. Um, and so if we need to, we can search for the Microsoft documents for this, and we can find out what the reserved variables are for build agents and things of that nature. Um, this one is just putting it in the build.artifact staging directory, which is a folder on the D drive of that agent. And then I'm going to publish that, publish pipeline artifacts. 
And I have no idea why uh, some of the developers in the room may know this, but I was working with the guys from GitHub when I was trying to figure this out about a year and a half ago. And, I, and they said, yeah, you're going to name this drop. And I said, why is it drop? And they go, I don't know. It's always been drop. Everyone who's ever taught me said, call it drop. So, okay, that's drop. At first, I started underscoring it and putting other stuff. I'm like, developers aren't going to tell me how I have to label my drop package. It's drop underscore. This is stupid. I should just stop at drop. Um, anyway, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and queue this to run it. And again, all it's doing is on that agent, it's going to open this up in Visual Studio. It's going to compile it. And it's going to give us a pipeline output. Hopefully, my internet is still working. That is required for this. There we go. OK, we've got a connection. All right, maybe this timed out on me. Let's just go back over here. Start the run. There we go. That's what I expected. OK, so you can see right down here it's queued. Now, this is going to look very fancy and overly complex, and it really is. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Logically, it's telling me exactly what's occurring underneath the covers. Um, these are the steps where if I get an error, I would reach out to a friend who's a developer, or I would open up a ticket, and I would go, what does this mean? Um, so this will run until completion. It's going to succeed because this is a pretty simple thing. Um, and when it succeeds, what will happen is we'll have all of the compiled output of the build of the project within that drop. And I will show you where we go and find that. That's what we're going to use in our release pipeline to be able to deploy it. All right, still building. The wonder of live demos. To think, me typing in the demo was the quickest part of the demo. I, uh, so that looked bad, but don't worry. It was just warnings. It went very quickly. You can go back and find those warnings. Something's probably deprecated that is an automatic process that it will take care of once again behind the scenes. I believe this is what we like to say in technology is auto magic. Component detection, post job, checkout, come on. There we go. Almost there. And we're done. OK, we can see that this job ran successfully. If I come back, now there's this one thing here where you can see one published, one consumed. If I click on this, well, there's our drop folder. And under that drop folder, I don't know why they call it S, but they call it S. But I can see there's my AdventureWorks arc test. Um, and inside of here, I can open up this. And then I can go down to the bin, to debug, which is where my DAC pack is stored. And that's where it is right there. Now, what I want to do is next I want to do a release. A release is just us saying, OK, we have our DAC pack. Now let's push it out onto our Arc system. And before I do that, I'm going to come back over here and just one more time iterated, no column right here other than these three. So we go to our release pipeline. I'm going to edit this so we can go ahead and see how it looks. Um, Right here is this artifact. This is the build. If I click on this, what I would find out is it's from that build pipeline. And whenever I make a build pipeline, and I say this in the blog, I'm not a smart man. I want to label something exactly what it is. So that way, it's easy for me to go and find it. So I literally called this Build Adventure Works 2020 DAC Pack. Why is it AdventureWorks 2020? Because I wanted to alias it with the year, and I was so like, I'd had such a rough day that by the time I aliased it, I forgot what year it was, and I put it in 2020. I mean, how typical, right? I think everything stopped that year. Thank goodness we're, we're going a little bit more. All right, so that's where we put our package. So it's literally pointing at the D drive. It's pointing at that drop package, that DAC pack. And if I come over here, I can take a look at this. And again, here's a task. And this da task is deployed using DAC pack. Again, on that marketplace, I can go in, out and find it. Now, there's also options if I wanted to deploy files. And what I want to do is upload those to a repo. And I want to deploy T-SQL files. There are, job, uh, there are tasks out there that I can use to be able to do that exact thing. So 
here's a DAC pack. You can see I'm specifying DAC pack server. Um, because it's ARC, I'm giving it one of the, uh, the node names specifically with a public IP address. Note to self, tear down that cluster now that I've shared that IP address with the world. Uh, I'm using SQL authentication, and I have a username, and I also have a password I provision. Now, I, um, this is going to change to where I can use Windows authentication in a subsequent ARC release. Right now, I'm using SQL authentication to get there. I'm going to go ahead and click uh, Create Release. This one will be a bit less complex. There's going to be a couple steps. But because we've only got one, we should get through it pretty quickly. Um, it's going to queue us right now while it's waiting for compute in whatever place with the Forge uh, with an Azure. Uh, I am really happy that this is a Saturday, actually, as I'm doing this. Because I'm like, man, everything's queuing up really quick. And I realize that it's queuing up really quick because none of my colleagues are actually working that also use this DevOps repo to deploy their items. So. This, this was very convenient. OK. Let's see. That step was downloading the artifact. This is deploy using the DAC pack. There's also some uh, verbose agents that you can use. There's different things, uh, little things. Think of them like trace flags. The, the thing that you saw, SQL password, that was a variable. Uh, password is a secure string. If you've ever used a secure string in DevOps, it must be in an encrypted state in order for it to be able to pass on. Um, and so what I did was there's a little place called variables. I went in there, I put my password, and there's a little lock. Once you click that lock, it, it, it shows all stars. It's essentially encrypted at that point in time. Um, and that makes it a secure string. That's a data type within ARM templates or within other DevOps deployment types, uh, very much like we have um, data types within SQL Server. OK, so this says it succeeded. So I'm going to come back over here to Azure Data Studio, to the columns. Let's do a refresh. There we go. And there's my writing. So again, one of the things that we want to consider when we're going to Azure, how also to be able to do DevOps, CI, CD, because that's going to be important, even in the data space. All right. So we've covered migrating to the cloud. We've covered CI, CD. Now it's security. This is going to be a little bit esoteric, and I'm going to wrap myself out that my demo didn't work. I have no idea why, but I had a VM I was trying to deploy. Everything looks to be successful. I ran a couple health checks on it, but it is not letting me uh, remote desktop into it, even when I do my just-in-time and I, I get validation for it. So. I'll be able to show you portions of this, but I won't be able to confirm this for you the way I'd like to. Trust me, it works. Um, I have another laptop that has my VPN certificate on it, and I didn't transfer it to this laptop. Had I done that, I just could connect via VPN, and I can show you how this works. Uh, but the key thing I want to make sure that we remember is how to secure something. If you're doing Synapse, again, I bring up Synapse because I work with it a lot. Um, understanding Azure Synapse Private Endpoints by Benjamin LaRue. Benjamin is a colleague of mine. He's in our CSA team, I think, in the States. And he did a wonderful breakdown of all things Azure Synapse. So if you're looking at using Azure Synapse, he covers managed virtual networks. He covers managed private endpoints. He covers private endpoints, the diagrams of how to be able to put these together. My team is actually doing a hackathon, a hackathon this week, and they're putting together ARM templates and CAF blueprints um, for private endpoints, because we've noticed tons of customers are having real issues being able to get this stuff up and running and being able to secure it correctly. Um, I'm going to have a blog that comes out as part of the Synapse series in another week. Um, after I get back and I get a review what they put together that's going to be based off all the work we've done to be able to help the deployment with private endpoints. But one of the key things, and this is in most data services that you want to use right now, um, you're looking at securing them by saying, here's my virtual network within Azure, and I want these things to communicate over this traffic. So you may say, you know, what's some best practices here, right? Okay, same word. 
Um, talk with your security team and determine what it is. You're all going to have re regulatory compliance that you have to look at using. Um, depending on your industry, some will be much stricter than others. I have customers that do not want to use private endpoints. That's their option. I recommend them because they're very secure. But there is additional overhead that once you begin using them, everything needs to be go uh, routed through that network. Um, so just keep in mind, when we look at this, we're looking at virtual network, express routes, the point-to-point -point site, site VPNs, additional things we want, storage firewall rules. Now, once you put those firewall rules in and you associate them with the network, you can't access that storage account from outside of Azure unless you're connected to your VPN in that network. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. I had a customer and we were uh, building an environment and they had a bunch of contractors who were from an outside firm and they did not have a VPN that they were using to access Azure. And they said, we've got a security requirement that's come down, we need to put firewalls on all the storage, we need to put private endpoints on our Azure Snaps analytics. And I had to have a quick meeting with them and I said, hey, I'm down with this, absolutely, let's do it. You're going to have some downtime while you just figure out how to give your developers access to this environment. They said, what do you mean? I said, when you do this, the folks over at that company do they have a VPN into your network? And they said, no, they don't. I said, okay, so you're going to have to figure out if you want them to use VMs in Azure Bastion, Windows Virtual Desktop, how it is you want them to now access your environment because they won't be able to access it via Storage Explorer. They won't be able to access it via Azure Snap Studio. Um, anything that we do and we put in this, it is now locked into that network. That's very good from a security practice, but and they, they went, hold on, we have to have a meeting on this because they're about to stop development for a couple of weeks while they have the debate of how do we let the developers back in. But they came back and they said, yep, absolutely, we're doing this. Okay, thumbs up, let's do it. Developers, you're getting a little bit of a vacation, have fun. And we figured that out over the next couple of weeks and then the developers, three weeks later, began developing all over again because we had that figured out, we had that configured. But that's something to think about. If you haven't pre-planned that security plan, when you come in and all of a sudden you have to change and get much more secure, there's additional things that we need to think about. Um, when we also do that, something to keep in mind, I was just looking at this, virtual networks, um, self-integrated hosted runtime Power BI gateways. There's an option to be able to turn off or disallow Azure services. Um, Part of that reason is if you have something discoverable, um, you can connect to it from another subscription. That's not part of your subscription. Now here's the thing. You've got to go know names. You've got to know IPs. You've got to have a lot of inside knowledge. But has anybody ever had an Azure subscription before and then you decided, I don't like this person working for my company. Let's get rid of them. They're fired. Well, they could easily go get an Azure subscription and they could use some of that stuff if they really wanted to and be a malicious actor. So what I like to say is we should also turn off allow Azure services. The second we do that, makes it a little bit harder to use some things like Power BI, um, or if we want to be able to access things that are not on that network, self-integrated hosted runtimes. Now the good news is if you're using Databricks, if you're using a managed instance, you can deploy it to a different subnet of the same virtual network. Snap's going to be able to talk to them just fine because again, we're in the same virtual network. And that gets into that network design and that topology that we're gonna think about when we start deploying things. So uh, if we have our Power BI, we might have a Power BI gateway. Um, we had to use a data gateway because Azure Analysis Services is not the friendliest service in the world right now um, to be able to allow to utilize private endpoints, hasn't been updated in quite some time, doesn't have a fully qualified domain name, has a set of IPs, and those IPs change weekly and monthly. So you would constantly have to re-whitelist IPs. And what we opted for was for a data gateway running on a virtual machine. Just so you know, it's quite robust. It can handle about a uh, uh, hundred different connections from 35 different Azure Snaps Analytics workspaces. So pre pretty beefy stuff for one VM uh, with about four cores and 16 gigs of RAM. But that's what we needed to do to be able to have a pathway in for the Azure Analysis Services. So this is why I say once we start turning on the security and the private endpoints, there's additional consideration. Um, and what does it always get back to, right? Money. And I can help you out with any technical problem in the world. But when it gets down to money, that's a business decision. And that's where I sit there and I'll be happy to go in a room with business folks and I'll go, look, 
I once worked for the White House under the Obama administration, and I was the lead DBA. And if anything happened to that data, I was the person that had to go get a lawyer and testify before Congress. And it came really close a couple times, but every single time we were able to make sure that things were done properly and done right. That's a scary feeling. So when it comes to security, you always want to make sure that you can walk into a room with your executives, with your boss, and go, hey, we did absolutely everything we could. I have a very good friend who works for SolarWinds, and I had told him that exact story before. And when everything happened to them, he texted me and he said, hey, thinking about you right now because it is no fun to testify before Congress. No, it is not. So that's one of those things. Not every job has those same stakes, but you do want to be able to say at the end of the day, if we didn't go down this route, we advise them to the best of our ability why we should take this route and it was a choice not taken for budgetary reasons. So a couple additional things, uh, Microsoft Defender for the Cloud. Defender for the Cloud, um, this is a really, really great service. We covered this in the migration pre-con. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though, depending on the number of transactions that you are utilizing on Azure storage or volume and things like that, you may find that this could be very, very expensive depending on what you have it monitoring. Fantastic for all forms of SQL because it prevents SQL injection um, at a relatively low cost. Something that I would absolutely recommend that we, um, that we put in place on any part of SQL. Um, there's a SQL vulnerability and assessment, advanced threat protection. The vulnerability and assessment, the nice thing, it can be annoying. Initially, it'll say, oh, here's all the things wrong with your system. But what you can do is you can go in there and you can say, ah, we actually need to have these uh, logins and we need to have them at this level of per uh, permission. Let me set a baseline and allow this in. And then if new things come in, they begin to trigger. What you want to make sure is that you don't have a reporting tool that is constantly coming up with red Xs. If there's going to be a loophole around something that it's flagging for security, um, and it often looks at things at a high pry level, um, and that's a level that the UK government and also Australia and also uh, the United States all look at as well. So you can lower that level of threshold, but if you do work for an organization that requires that Fed ramp high, um, it will flag things specifically with them. But you can say, nope, we're going to allow this as our baseline. But don't let there just be red checks because that, then you get emails that you tend to ignore, right? Oh, that's always wrong. Those are, those are always like that. And then if something comes up, it's easy to miss. So we want to make sure that we go in there and we set those baselines properly um, so we have all the green check marks that we expect. So this is an example of what I was talking about from a network architecture. Um, say we have an office, and again, a lot of us are remote. Even after the pandemic, <clears throat> a lot of us are going to stay remote. But that office will have a network wherever our servers are located. And in that network range, that's typically where we would VPN into. We may be VPNing directly into a cloud-based subscription at some point in time, but if you have an on-prem network that you initially hop into, you want to make sure that that has a network gateway that connects into Azure and into whatever the default network is. And that's another thing to keep in mind. I could have multiple segments of networks, but have that one base virtual networks, and then I can create a truss and a gateway between those to be able to allow as many networks and as much communication as I would like. So you have a lot of things at uh, core capabilities that you can utilize. This is an example of having an Azure Snaps Analytics with a couple private endpoints right here. I've got a SQL managed instance that perhaps is my OLTB database. Um, and you'll notice that it's in subnet two. My uh, private endpoints here are on subnet one, um, but they're on the same virtual network. And so therefore I have connectivity. Uh, then I may have um, some VMs where I utilize Azure Bastion to be able to allow people to access my network, to be able to develop against Synapse, um, and Bastion is the way that we want them to be able to access this. So that way they're not actually RDPing into, uh, into the environment. And then here's my Power BI gateway. Because I've got these private endpoints, Power BI is connecting through here, and then my data lake via its firewall is also peered with this virtual network. So if I want to get in and I want to do anything with that uh, network, or I'm sorry, with that, um, that data lake, I need to make sure I'm VPN'd and I'm connected into that network. All right, hold on. So you can see I grayed this out. I debated whether I was going to show you or not, but I'm, I'm okay showing you my failures. 
I'm going to go to my resource groups real quick. Uh, there we go. All right, so in here you can see I have quite a few things. Let me get myself a little more space. So I've got a host of disks. I've got some SQL Insights monitoring. I've got my dedicated pool. I've got a couple dedicated pools. I've got databases uh, with my managed instance that are in here. This is one of those examples of the entire project is in a resource group. The nice thing is I go away and I can just delete this resource group. It cleans itself up quite nicely. I've got my network security groups. Here's my private DNS. You can see these endpoints right here. These are private endpoints specifically for Synapse Analytics. Um, there's a dev one, so if you want to do CI CD, you're going to need a VM um, that is on your network that does specific builds for your DevOps that has connectivity and access to Synapse because this private endpoint is the only way it can get it. So that's called having um, a dedicated build server. Some folks have build servers on premise and they run DAC effects on it. Uh, but again, when we start getting into uh, those private endpoints, everything's affected. Um, this is SQL because there's a private endpoint to access uh, SQL pools. There's a private endpoint uh, for serverless pools, which is called SQL On Demand. Um, and then there's also one for the web interface. So if I actually come out and I attempt, let's see, let me come over here. I'm going to go into my Azure Synapse. Here's my private link, Azure Synapse Analytics. First thing I'm going to get is an error. Should be an error. Let's see if it works properly, right? The thing I won't be able to show you is if I connect it to the VM properly, how the errors go away. Yeah, immediately. I don't have access to the pipelines and data sets and whatnot. Now, I actually get this to load, and this is a very important thing to keep in mind because I am in my Active Directory account, and my Azure Active Directory account is the owner of this Synapse Analytics workspace, and it does have access to it. So it allows me to be able to at least get to the web page to see it, but even then it's telling me I'm denied. And maybe I go, well, I just don't have the proper level of permission, so let me come down here and um, uh, I can't use the serverless built in either. It says temporarily available. It's up and it's running and I could utilize it, but it's telling me it's temporarily uh, unreachable because I am not on the private network to be able to get it. There's a firewall issue. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it is even so kind as to point that up right here. Unable to connect to serverless SQL pool because of a network firewall issue. Well, maybe I just need a uh, little more permissions and I can come down here and give myself some God level access. Nope. Even though I am an admin and I have God level access on this, this Synapse Analytics, it doesn't actually let me see that. This is completely locked down and I cannot access it. Now, I wouldn't even be able to get through the web portal to this if my AAD wasn't connected in it. So keep that in mind. Uh, anybody else trying to access, if they knew your Synapse, um, there's a little page where, and let me show you this. If I go to uh, web.azuresynapse.com, it's going to prompt me and I have to go, oh, I'm associated with my Microsoft network and then it's going to make me choose a subscription and then it makes me choose a drop down box of the Synapse uh, um, that I have available to me. I'm going to stop right here because I'm not going to show, I'm, I'm connected to a lot of different development um, subscriptions and I don't want to blast that online. Oh, it loaded mine up, that's nice. So workspace name and again, there's private link, continue. Get the same error, right? I, I can't access it. Now, had I got my VM to launch, what I would show you is if I get in there, I have full access to it. Everything is up and running. Everything is fine. I can create a link service. Um, but this is just realizing that what we've got going on is we, we've restricted this. Even though I have the full access to this, I cannot get there unless I am on the VPN that I have created or unless I am actually Azure Bastioned into a, a VM that can access that network. So good security type stuff. We want to make sure that nobody can access things we don't want them to access. All right. We've covered migration from on-premise uh, to the cloud, CI, CD, security. Last level is HADR. So couple things to keep in mind. Terminology, right? 
HA is high availability, DR is disaster recovery. HA does not equal DR, and I cannot say that enough times. Um, high availability is some small event, a blip, a power outage. Somebody sneezed and spilled their coffee on a server and it shorted out. Something of that nature has happened and where everything is fine, it's fine, don't panic, we've, we've got this set up, we're back up and running very quickly. High availability is also specifically for certain systems. It's not for all systems. I mean, not to be classist, but there are some systems that just don't need that level of high ability. It's not cheap, it's expensive. Um, takes time to be able to set up. Disaster recovery is a disaster has happened. The South Central Data Center in 2018, a dinner center, um, lightning struck, industrial chillers were offline because we were certifying a new one with OSHA. The automatic fell over to the chiller, did not happen. The temperature started to rise in the data center. Data center thought it was on fire, evacuated all the humans, flooded out all the oxygen. By the way, with no oxygen, it gets hotter. Things started melting. Um, and then the fire department had to come let all the humans know that everything's fine, you can go back in, and then we had to go back in and go, well, this is melted, but the hard drives are fine and the data is fine, let's bring it back up, and we did. But that's disaster recovery. Oh my God, something has happened. We need email and we need the network back up, that's tier zero, and then after that, we need to start bringing up the systems that we can count the money we're losing. There are some nice to haves, right? Bob over in counting, sweet guy, has an app, doesn't fucking matter, Bob. We're, we're going to be fine. It's going to take four months for us to be able to get you back up and running, but you can put it in an Excel spreadsheet till then. We know it's good. So it's important to keep in mind these things. Service level agreements. This is the agreement you have with the business to be able to be up and running in a certain amount of time. This should drive your, H avail your um, high availability. This could also uh, cover your disaster recovery. Um, Sorry, service level objective, my goodness. Service level agreement was what I just covered. Service level objective is getting back very quickly. Recovery time objective. Recovery time objective, you don't have to worry about that as much as the cloud, especially if you're using a PaaS service because we're not gonna let you lose data. Um, but if you're on-prem, that is critical to make sure that your backup strategies are correct and that you're able to recover those backups and then get them processed in a certain amount of time. Failover part, um, piecemeal restores uh, from uh, partitioning is a big key to that. Customer with a 24 terabyte database, um, they were a telecom customer in Africa and uh, they had to uh, provide a report to the government every single month. If they did not provide that report, they were shut down. Hard drives went out. We restored the latest versions that they needed to be able to re uh, run the reports on that particular month. We got them back up and running, but that was about 500 gigs worth of data. The other 23.5 terabytes could wait and come back online slowly because that was not critical to what we needed right then at that moment. So there's some really good stuff out there. Um, a quick question, but again, we don't have a lot of time. Do you have HA for your business? If your uh, database is HA uh, and your application is not, is it really HA? The answer is it's not. And then how does HA differ from DR? And then here's a couple docs on Traffic Manager and Azure Site Recovery. Architecture we could look at, again, keep in mind, very simplistic, but if I have an application and it goes to a database, I could use Azure Site Recovery to be able to block level copy that database. I could have deployments going to prod and to DR for my app site, and then I've got Traffic Manager, and Traffic Manager is going to know which region is up and running and where I should route the traffic. You might even put a Traffic Manager in a third separate region that is not dependent upon the other two regions, so it's always guiding the traffic in an independent format. Um, HADR, but using Traffic Manager for your app, using a load balancer, and then going directly to an Azure SQL database that's geo-replicated. Again, there's no specific right answer I'm going to tell you. We could do this a multitude of ways. We could use a geo failover cluster for managed instance, um, just as easily as we could use the GeoDR for the database. All right, so what do we cover? Migration on-premise, CICD, security, HADR, this is the feedback survey. I've got two of them. One is for my boss. The other one is for Bits. Please let them know if I did a good job. Um, apologies to Bob if he didn't like the way that I handled his app being down. Um, but other than that, I think we're going to be OK. Uh, this is at Microsoft Learn at the Microsoft booth. Um, they have uh, 
percentage off on certifications. And also, Learn is a great tool uh, to be able to pick up a technology. It opens up a sandbox. You don't get charged for it, and it allows you to be able to consume this uh, material and get very hands-on. Very, very good stuff. We're going to say questions, and also that's Tom Hanks. So thanks, everybody. Did we have any questions online? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'll make sure that we get that. Um, if you want to run um, your infrastructure bills in telecom, is there any problem with doing that? Or will it just handle it all the same? That's a great question. So Michael asked, if you want to run your infrastructure bills in Teradata, is there any issue doing that? Um, I don't know if 100% of all Azure services are represented in Teradata. I know that um, Synapse recently uh, that did, but I'm not sure if the private endpoints are completely covered. Um, managed instance uh, is something that got covered, I think, late last year. Um, from an infrastructure standpoint of doing your network and your servers, and the majority of networking technology shouldn't be an issue. Great question. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, MS Learn. Oh, the one before that, gotcha. And, and they also have a copy of this at the Microsoft booth. Um, and, and so they've, they've got that printed out and they've actually got that in the placard in the, in the center, center area where, uh, where the desk is. Any other questions? Sorry, uh, could you say that one? Is there a tool which currently can assess the current uh, on-premise uh, SQL and the give you the performance and you can provision? That's a very good question. So the question was, is there a currently a tool on-premise um, that can kind of map out your environment and also collect performance data uh, to be able to give you an assessment? I believe Azure Migrate does that. I know we acquired a company about a year and a half ago. Um, one of the key things that used to be missing was IOPS. One of the things I would always say is uh, validate that it um, actually measures the IOPS that you have on your underlying systems. Because the number one issue I see, especially in VM provisioning or going to an Azure service, um, is not having an accurate estimate of the amount of IOPS you need. If you're on pure storage on premise, we're going to need to build a very beefy VM with really, really great storage associated with it. M-series, um, right accelerator drives. Um, we might not need Ultra if we go M-series, but, but it's going to be a very pricey VM. And I know some people that need those. Uh, keep in mind that an Azure disk, the size of a disk, um, is not just commiserate in size. It's commiserate in performance. And so if you have, uh, it's built on blob storage. If you ever look at blob storage, as something grows in blob, it gets more IOPS associated with it. Jovan Popovic did a brilliant set of blogs on SQL Managed Instance for Medium, and he used that specifically to show how you could tune the underlying storage by growing the log file um, and the data file specifically to be able to hit a higher level of IOPS by extending the size of them because of, of blob storage requirements to be able to um, process additional IOPS. Um, so I, I had a DBA that I was working with and um, they had a server and they said, I want a one terabyte drive. And I went, yeah, but what we actually need to do to get your IOPS requirement is we need to stripe multiple uh, 512 gig drives together to be able to get that level of IOPS. And they said, well, this is a four terabyte drive. I don't want four terabytes, I want one. And so we went through a whole exercise. I said, well, you know what? You can specify your IOPS and your size with an uh, ultra SSD. Let's do that. And we went and the performance was only about five megabytes off between what I provisioned and what the ultra SSD was. And um, the cost was about $25,000 more a month. And I said, I'm not in sales. So the sales guy would probably hit me if he were here. I said, but I really say we don't go with the Ultra SSD. It's there if you need it. You can get that level of performance, but keep in mind, you're really going to pay for it. But then again, pure storage isn't cheap either. So, um, if, if they have added the... It, 
if they've added IOPS to Azure Migrate, that's going to be the closest thing right now. I know there's some third-party companies that are working on some additional things, but nothing's been launched yet. Um, a lot of what I do is I'll review the metrics that we get and capture on tools, um, and then I meet with people. Again, part of the planning is when we identify a workload and we want to move it and migrate it, just making sure that we've got all the boxes ticked to make sure that um, we're actually going to get the level of performance we expect up there. And often, I can't say this enough, test, test, and retest. Um, the people that just build and blindly go are the ones who have the most issues. The people who get up there and test and find issues and go, what do we do to get around this? Oh, let's fix these following things. Test again, yep, that's a lot better. Let's go ahead and move. Those are the ones who don't have issues. So make, make sure that your organization bakes in time for testing. No problem. Any other questions? Thank you all very much.